Hey everyone, welcome, welcome. I, I see so many people have introduced themselves on the chat um, and saying where they're from. It's so awesome to see so many awesome organizers here um, and getting ready for Jano. So welcome to Supercharge Your Group with incentive, Incentives and Rewards with uh, Jono Bacon. Uh, I'm gonna go over a, a couple small logistics for this webinar that we're running and then we'll get right into it. So to get started, a couple of things that people are wondering, this event is being recorded and we will share the recording with everyone after the event is finished. So stay tuned. Um, you can find all of our recordings on our blog, Community Matters, at meetup.com slash blog. If you sign up for the newsletter, which you can do right on the, on the blog website, we'll send you um, an email with the recording. Uh, you can also check back to the event page um, for the recording, but we share it in a few places. So, so keep an eye out for that. Um, the, you'll notice that you're muted. So everybody's muted by default. So you won't be able to uh, communicate by speaking, but we have a few options. If you want to chat with people in the webinar, you can use the chat function. But if you want to ask us a question, um, which you can do at any time during the webinar, use the Q&A feature on the bottom. So if you, if you look um, on this little bottom tab, you'll see chat, um, raise hand, and Q&A. So you're gonna to wanna to use that Q&A function to ask a question. If you ask a question in the chat, um, it's unlikely that we're gonna be able to answer it. So make sure you uh, direct people who are asking in there to the Q&A function. Um, and we'll be answering those live throughout the webinar. And then if there's anything that's not answered that we don't have time to get to, um, we'll go ahead and answer that in the blog post um, or follow up with even more uh, video recording answers. So stay tuned to that, check out the blog for that recording. Um, so here's a little bit about what we're gonna get into. So we all uh, introduced to each other. My name is Ben, I'm the content lead at Meetup. Um, and then Jono is gonna come on and talk about uh, supercharging your group. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome community and collaboration consultant and author, John O'Bacon. All righty, let me turn everything on <clears throat> and share my screen. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everybody. All right, can you see my screen? Let me just make sure you can actually see it. Can you see that, Ben? I just wanna make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Yes, I can see it. Okay, great, perfect. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Orbitum Bacon Space Station um, here in, in California. Thank you for, for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm really excited about getting into this. We're going to cover um, a whole load of ground in this. Um, and I'm going to start right at the beginning. OK, I was born and raised in northern England <clears throat> and northern England looks a little bit like this. OK, um, it's very picturesque and really quite boring as well. And um, when I was growing up, one of the things that my friends, my family, uh, my grandparents would always talk about was how people don't know their neighbors like they did back in the good old days. And I wasn't seeing this, okay? I was, just wasn't seeing this kind of lack of community happening. And the reason for that is, this is because when I was about 19 years old, I was getting interested in open source and technology. I was living at home. I had hair back then. And then my hair started growing inwards and coming out my toes. And, um, and uh, I, I discovered open source and I started by building a little community called Linux UK. And this is where people in the UK kind of got together to share um, ideas and perspectives about how, how Linux was forming. Now, this is back in 1998, it was in the very early stages of the internet in the UK and certainly in the early stages of open source as well. Um, so I went to university um, to, the, to the West Midlands and I started a Linux user group. And this isn't the first time I really experienced the notion of a meetup event. Okay. And this was before meetup. Um, I'm not sure actually if meetup even existed at this point. It may, may have done, um, but we weren't using it back then. Um, and um, and it was a, it's just a really fun way of kind of connecting with people in person, having really interesting conversations. I just hadn't been able to experience that kind of engagement with people in a face-to-face -face setting. So started working on that. And then that kind of got me into like the rabbit hole, right? Started contributing to a project called KDE and going down to conferences and exhibiting and started writing for magazines. And I went and worked at Open Advantage and then went and started traveling around the world and doing speaking gigs. 
uh, and working on individual projects and building communities around them. The reason why I'm going through this kind of condensed version of a of probably a quite long and boring biography is that this just didn't hold true. I just didn't believe it, is that we were seeing people coming together, people building communities. And the reason why this is exciting, and I think the reason why so many of you are joining today, is because when we look at the world around us, and we look at these just hundreds of thousands of people around the world who are forming together into meetup groups, many of you obviously are, are doing this, and people who are not in here are doing this, the reason why this works is because we have this incredible network of minds. It's a network of talent, time, expertise, all of these different elements kind of come together. So what I'm talking about in this session today is when we talk about incentives, it's how do we tap into this community that we're forming around these groups to make them even more rewarding, even more engaging for people to be able to participate in. Now, these communities are not a rare thing. They're not a rare site. We've seen Wikipedia bringing people together to democratize access to content. I mean, many of you may, maybe grew up in the, in the days when you, you didn't have access to as much information online. And people used to use books and encyclopedias, encyclopedias existed in books, believe it or not, not online. But we've seen the growth of the open source movement, which has revolutionized how technology is created and delivered. We've seen the maker revolution, which is kind of, broken down the line between atoms and bits and people have built incredible inventions all over the world and then we've also seen the democratization of funding with something such as crowdfunding so communities are really powerful and they're spreading around the world and we've seen them in many many different industries for example harley davidson have built a community of over 1700 local groups who get together to talk about their bikes we've seen salesforce and sap have built communities of um, millions of users who provide support and guidance and run events. Star Citizen raised $250 million to build a video game. Lego Ideas actually encourage people to come together to build Lego sets, many of which then sell in stores. And one example I just want to drop in here is called Hit Record, which is actually launched by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who's an Emmy award-winning actor. I had the fortune to meet him at an event once, and he told me about this. And they bring people together to work on shared productions, such as, you know, someone will do the music, someone will write the script, someone will film the, the scene. And many of these have been showcased at Sundance. So it's pretty incredible what's happening. And it all comes back to this incredible network of minds. Now, the reason why I'm here today, and thank you to my friends at Meetup for, for inviting me, and thank you, even more importantly, for you folks for joining, is that... I think Meetup is one of the finest examples of, of communities in action, okay? We often talk about these million person communities that are happening, and happening around the world, examples that I just walked through of Salesforce and SAP and Fitbit and places like that. But to me, the, the heartbeat of what makes communities so powerful are actually the thousands and thousands of people around the world who participate together in smaller groups. And they usually are focused on a, um, you know, kind of a, a specific topic, or an interest, that's kind of what really brings them together. So to me, what you're doing and what you're doing with your groups and the way you run your events, I think is super exciting. And what I wanna cover in this session is gonna be some ways to think about how you build your community. But before we get to the incentives piece, I wanna really start with some of the foundational elements, which I think are really important for us to get into, because to be honest with you, I don't think you can build a, an amazing community unless you have some of these foundational elements there, because it's almost like if you want to go and bake a cake, you need to understand the role of each ingredient. You need to understand the role of, of, the, of the oven that you put it into before you can really get the best results out of it. So the first piece, there's kind of three pieces, and the third one is going to be the incentives. But the first piece is that the best experiences are journeys. Now, you know, many of you have probably been at Disney World. Uh, we have a seven-year-old boy and we've taken our kid there and enjoyed its incredibly overpriced experience. But when you go to Disney, one of the things that's interesting about it is every element of the journey is mapped out, right? So when you show up and you, you park your car and you go and buy your tickets and then how you go into the park and how they manage traffic there and how they guide you around the park and how they time the shows and time access to the restaurants, all of these different elements are incredibly carefully thought out so the consumer gets the most value and the park is able to manage the most amount of traffic coming in on any given day. Another example of this will be a restaurant, okay? So when you go to a, 
a good restaurant from how you book your table, how you show up, if you valet your car, when they bring you water out and get your menus and how you choose things and the cadence in which the dish is coming out. It's all really carefully designed and carefully thought out. And another example of this would also be video games. You know, we just recently bought Luigi's Mansion 3, uh, Luigi's Mansion 3 for the Nintendo Switch, which if you haven't played is a lot of fun. It's great for young kids. And, you know, the first level is all about picking up the controls and kind of getting used to it and understanding how the game operates. Um, and what that enables you to do is to kind of pick up the game and then do some tasks that you can actually accomplish. And it builds your confidence in, in, in being able to approach the game. So these are really, really carefully designed journeys. And I think we need to apply the same thing to meetup groups. To me, a meetup needs to be way more than just the page, okay? And I'm sure that with the folks that are involved in this session, there's gonna be many of you that are gonna be, um, you know, very, very active in building out your community in different ways. There's gonna be some of you who are a little bit more at the beginning of this journey. So what I'd encourage you as the first thing is to think about what that journey looks like from when somebody shows up to your meetup uh, group for the very first time or somebody comes to your very first event for the very first time, what is that experience like? How do you keep people engaged? How do you keep people participating? How do you keep kind of the energy flowing? Because in the same way that if you walk up to a restaurant, I know this is a bad example in these current times of COVID-19, but if you walk up to a restaurant and there's no one in there and, you know, why would you go in? But if you go up to a restaurant and it's bustling and it's exciting and, and people are enjoying you know, themselves in there, you can see that there's a spare table, you're probably more likely to go in. Momentum and solid experience is what builds growth. Now that can be confusing, right? How on earth do you go about doing that? Well, I think the good news here, let me just move my window around, hang on a second. I'm losing my windows here. I think the first thing uh, that you're gonna want to do um, is, uh, is, is kind of follow a, a kind of a predictive journey. And this is the way I would recommend this journey. This is something I just wrote about in my new book, People Powered. So it all begins with your target persona. Like who are the people who, um, who you want to come to your group? And this is gonna vary with every different group that you've got out there. Some of you will be focusing on tech, some of you will focus on knitting, some of you will focus on sports, some of you will be support groups such as breast cancer, you know, who is that audience and what, are their, what do they care about? What are their pain points? What are the things that they want to get out of this? And I'd think very closely about what those key elements are because that's going to determine how you can shape value for, for your prospective uh, group members to be as interesting as possible, okay? Because fundamentally incentives are a way of saying, um, if you do this thing, then you get this value. And so we need to understand what that value is first of all. Now, the second phase of this journey then is to get them onboarded as quickly and as easily as possible into your group. Now, the way this happens for most meetup groups is that they run events, right? Is that someone shows up to, to your event and they walk in and I've been to some meetups that do a terrible, just a terrible version of this, right? Where it isn't very organized. People feel very uncomfortable. They don't really know anyone. They feel uncomfortable enough that they leave after five or six minutes. But when I've been to great meetup events, People show up and they're welcomed in and they're introduced to some other people to kind of break the ice and there's a little bit of networking. There's maybe some food and drinks that are there and it, and it really kind of goes quite well. And again, that's thinking about that journey. So what does that onboarding experience look like? Now, we can't just merely depend on the in-person events right now because of COVID. So what does that look like in an online setting? You know, how do you welcome people into your, into your meetup group when they join? But then what happens is we want to get them to the start. And that start is basically that first piece of value. There is this misnomer out there in the community world that if you build it, they will come, right? And in many cases, sadly, if you build it, they actually don't come. They don't show up. So what you want to do is you want to be very clear on what's that first piece of value. So imagine, for example, that you've got a knitting group, right? Somebody comes and joins. They're obviously interested in knitting. Well, maybe as soon as they join, you give them some free knitting patterns. Maybe what happens is they come in and then you ask them to come into a discussion, an online discussion where they can introduce themselves and share kind of what they're interested in and what they want to do. And that can spark some conversation. Maybe you connect them with another member of the group who can kind of be their buddy to kind of get them get started. So these are the kind of things that I think are really interesting to get people to that first position of value. If they can experience value very quickly, then they're more likely to stick around. Now what happens is they typically go into three different phases. And I really want to focus on this because this is really important. When, they're, when they first join up, they're casual. They don't really know what they're doing. They're kind of nervous. There's a lot of imposter syndrome. 
Then they kind of step into being regulars where they're showing up on a regular basis and they're tending to hang out. And then finally, a very small number of people will become core. And these are your super passionate, obsessive users in your, in your meetup group, okay? So what we want to do is want people to come into as the casual once they've first joined and get them comfortable enough where they become regulars. Now, to become a regular, you need to build a habit. It takes about 60 days to build a habit. If you want to lose weight, if you want to stop drinking as much booze, whatever it might be, it takes about 60, 60 to 66 days generally to build that habit. So at the beginning of that habit building journey, it's incredibly complicated. You've got to be disciplined and that's hard for most people. But then as you kind of go through that 60 day period, gradually it becomes easier and then it becomes second nature. I know this first time because when I first moved to America 12 years ago, I'd literally never exercised. I never grew up around exercise. I never had a family that exercised very much. And my wife is an exercise fiend and she got me into the habit. Um, and it, that first 60 days really sucked but then now I exercise every week. So that's how habits tend to work. So we want to get them into casual, then to regulars, then to core. And I'll get to how we move them through that a little bit later on. But when they're casual and they're brand new to your group, this is all about a regular flow of education and support, right? So think of ways in which you can help them to solve problems. Um, again, if they come into the knitting group, they're trying to figure out how to get started with knitting. How can you get them started with that? Encourage them to build relationships. This is where introducing people to each other, getting them to know each other. If you do this in person, you know, it's kind of, you know, connecting two people together and, and introducing an icebreaker conversation so they can get started. If doing this online, it's bringing them into a shared communication platform that they can use, whether it's the forum or whether it's somewhere else where they can build those friendships. It's about providing training and programs that maybe talk to your members about how they can create maybe just 10 minute um, training videos for your specific topic and share those to new group members when they come in. Maybe have some instructional blog posts or tutorials or, or specific mentoring programs. This means that when they come in, that value that they experience is super powerful. And then that makes them want to hang out because they're getting something out of the group. Okay. And then you can look to your group members to kind of generate that material. Now, typically when people get into the regulars phase, so they've been around for a while, they've got to know people a little bit, they're excited about this. Now, this is where you can look to your group members to start generating content um, to, you know, to, uh, to serve the people who are coming in who are new as well. So this is where you can group people together. You know, maybe you do some matchmaking where people can work together on some content. Maybe in larger groups, you have sub teams. So if you've got, let's say a, a group that's focused on, let's say, cryptocurrencies. Maybe you'll have one group that's going to be focused on Bitcoin, another group that will be group that will be focused more on something like Ethereum. So you can subdivide these in, into these different sub teams. And you can also look into things like organizing competitions or in the tech space, things like hackathons. So there are all kinds of ideas that you can come up with once you've got your regulars who've been around your group for a couple of months. Now, when you start getting into the third phase, this, these are the core members. These are usually a handful of people who are incredibly engaged in your group. They're, you know who they are by name. They're just incredibly passionate and excited about this. So what you do is you work with those folks to help them to kind of tap into their wisdom. Set up one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. Involve them in plan planning out future events uh, and features that you might want to focus on. Maybe bring them into a private forum or a discussion channel really tap into them and unlock their ideas and creativity because what happens is they then feel part of the group and they feel like they can shape it more and more. What you don't want to have is, you know, one or two people make all of the decisions about how your meetup group uh, functions and organizes because you want everybody to feel like they've got an opportunity to shape that. But your, your, your core people are the people who've been around there. They've done that and you can really tap into them for that really blunt unencumbered feedback for what to do. So, this provides kind of, you can think of it as almost like a skeleton for how you go about thinking, building that journey. And I would really strongly recommend you do this. Now, this might seem like a lot of work. I'm sure you're sat there and you're thinking, good grief, this seems so complicated. How do I even get started with it? Well, just pick something off. You know, think about maybe, okay, well, what is the content we give people when they join? Um, how do we um, simplify the onboarding? So they've got maybe a buddy who, when they join the group. Just start doing something and looking at how well it performs, and then that's how you kind of make progress. Now, how do you move people from casual to regulars to core? Well, this is where incentives play a role, and I'm gonna get into this a little bit later on, but I really wanna to touch on one more thing beforehand, and that is that we, it's, I think it's really, really critically important 
that we design for people. And what I, what I mean by this is, like, just look at what's happening right now. I'm looking at the chat, right? And keep the chat going. It's always good to see what you think or any questions or, sorry, well, keep your questions to the questions piece. But just looking through about what are the things that you're thinking about? What are the, where are you from? Where, where in the world are you? We've got a ton of people, right? Um, 171 people, as I look at it right now, from all over the world um, who are signing into this. You've all got your own different ideas and perspectives and challenges and what you want to do here with your respective meetup communities. Um, and we're focusing a lot on technology. We're using Zoom. We're using meetup.com. We're using all of these different tools. But we sometimes forget that it's people under the covers. And with communities and what makes communities thrive are the ones that really understand the psychology of how people think. In the same way that if you want to build a really great piece of technology, you need to understand the machine that it runs on. If you, need, if you want to build, uh, if you want to create a great piece of food, let's say a cake, as I mentioned, you need to understand your ingredients and the tools that you've got available to you. If you want to be a great guitarist, you need to understand the instrument and how it works. And it's the same thing with when we build communities. You can think of your meetup group as a vessel in which people spend time with each other, but it's the people coming together that's the really juicy piece of that equation. So if we understand their psychology, by definition, we can build a community that's more exciting, that just resonates with them more deeply as a human being. Okay. And we don't have to get too, you know, into some bunch of hippie stuff here. <laughs> you know, I'm not suggesting we start getting into, into that whole world, just the core psychology of this. And the way I've broken this down is that there's fundamentally six phases when people join any community. And it, this especially applies to, to meetup communities and meetup groups. One is that they need access. They need to be able to get started. And that typically will mean showing up to an event or it could be joining your virtual event. And then they're going to want to contribute in some way. So usually when they access the group, first of all, um, you know, this is going to be you know, when they access that group, this is going to be showing up and consuming information, consuming content and getting to know people. But then as they start talking more and more, then they're going to start wanting to contribute, maybe contribute into some discussions, first of all, maybe then contribute in a talk or a workshop or something along those lines. As they start participating more and more, they'll build a sense of self-respect that they are, this sounds maybe a little silly, but they feel worthy that they're there, that they're having an opportunity to kind of go there and add some kind of value. And that builds a real sense of dignity that they are an important part of this group that makes this work, okay? Now, when you get that combination of contribute, self-respect and dignity, and that happens over and over again, it builds that sense of dignity and it gives people the ability to then suggest that they can have an impact. They can start coming up with ideas. Well, why don't we come up with these new ways of running our group? Why don't we try an unconference approach? Why don't we run a virtual summit? Why don't we coordinate a hackathon? Why don't we coordinate um, swag and incentives and rewards for people? That's when people feel the ability to have an impact. And that's when you get the creati creativity of the group really forming. When this happens over and over again, it builds a sense of belonging. And this is the ultimate treasure in any community. When people feel like they belong somewhere, um, then they, they stick around for years. Every one of you knows what this feels like. So, you know, think about your own life, the families that you may belong in, the companies that you may belong in, the, the, the community groups that you may belong in. When you feel part of something, it's incredibly powerful. So this is the reason why this journey is, 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 is important, okay? So Patrick says, you know, how is human-centered design a hippie thing? That's a, good, that's a good point. That's not what I meant. What I mean by, you know, I get the fact that some people who are more analytical in nature are very suspicious of a lot of the psychological stuff and they think of it as being a more hippie thing. But to your point, Patrick, this is all about human-centered design. If we really focus on that design, then we can build great human systems and that's what communities are. So the, the, what's fundamental here is to really focus on the in point and the out point, right? If you really focus on access, first of all, and then move your way through that, I think what happens is you will, by definition, build a meetup group that just feels more relevant and more interesting and just more pleasurable to be around. People won't necessarily know quite why as much, but you're, you're basing it on those core psychological principles. And I think looking into things such as um, you know, behavioral economics and the incentives that we're going to get into is going to touch into this too. Now, this does raise a bit of a challenge because the world, you know, kind of looks a little bit like this, right? There's so many distractions. There's big piles of content. 
and initiatives and everybody's vying for your time, right? People are trying to get to you on social media and in your inbox and you're seeing all these YouTube ads and these YouTube videos and these podcasts. There's so much noise out there. So it, this all begs the question, you know, what makes some people want to try something new? What makes people want to come to your group and get in there? Well, again, this might sound like I'm a broken record, is that it provides value, <clears throat> is that you have something that they want. Um, there's a lot of people out there in communities and they set up a community because they're like, wouldn't it be great if we kind of come together and hang out and did this? And that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. And often those communities can, can be very successful. But the communities that I think are really valuable and that really work are the ones where they focus every meetup event, every virtual event, all of these different things on real value. It's that you get new material, ideas, perspectives, that you have the opportunity to discuss them with people uh, very crisply and clearly. That's what kind of brings people in. So a good example of this is something such as Masterclass. You've probably seen these YouTube ads. I actually registered for it around Christmas time uh, because they had a two for one deal and I bought one uh, for my dad because he's a very curious mind. And look, it's not cheap, but what's cool about it is they've got tons of really valuable content wrapped up in this and it justifies the price of admission. And many of you will be running free meetup groups. So it's not that you necessarily need to charge, but it's the value. What got me into Masterclass, what made me click on the ad, frankly, was that there was something in there that I thought was interesting that I wanted to look at. So, you know, how you describe that value for your group is really important. That's the biggest possible incentive of all is what gets people through the door is that they feel like there's reasons why they should be there. They can learn interesting new things. They can meet really cool people. They can explore ideas. And that's what's going to continue to build them towards that sense of belonging. Another example of this would be something such as Firefox, right? On their front page, they tell you exactly why you should consider Firefox, um, you know, instead of using Chrome or, or Safari or something along those lines. So the building a journey and um, designing that human-centered design approach to things is really important, I think, before you even think about incentives. Because the problem with incentives, and we're going to get to this right now, because incentives are the third and I think the final piece here. The reason why incentives work is because we're incentivizable creatures, which I'll get to in a second. But the problem is, is that when people use incentives in the wrong way, they come across as cheap and tacky, right? So I'm sure all of you have seen these awful, you know, ads on YouTube for things like you can make $10,000 a day with one hour's worth of work. If you go through my course, right? Or you'll see download my proven blueprint for this, that, and the other. And what they do is they promise you the earth, but then what they give you in many cases is pretty mundane, not particularly exciting material. So I think when you really focus on understanding your audience and you bring them in with the right reasons and you focus on offering them lots of value, then when you apply incentives, you're doing it in a more human centered way and you're doing it as part of that structured journey. You're not just throwing things at the wall to see how it will stick. So let's get into the incentives piece. So here's the thing, as I mentioned earlier on, human beings are really incentivizable creatures, okay? Um, it's the reason why we collect airline miles. It's the reason why we um, go to a coffee shop and get that little coffee card stamped 10 times and then you get your free coffee or a sandwich card. It's the reason why we get badges in video games and on Fitbit, or the reason why we like the, you know, the Reddit karma and things like that. So this clearly works. And the reason why this works is somewhat psychological in nature is that the human brain is broken into two areas. It's called system one and system two thinking. System one is our monkey animal brain that is keeping us alive and looking for danger. System two is our conscious brain. It's, what we're, it's what, how we make kind of logical decisions. And our system one part of the brain, we are really hunter gatherers, right? That bit of the brain hasn't had an upgrade in a long time. So we're always looking to gather food and resources to protect ourselves, okay? And it's completely subconscious. So one of the reasons why incentives works is because we like to collect things. We like to gather things, okay? So it taps into that just natural human need and that's why we're very attracted to them. But when you look at an incentive, what you need to do is fundamentally, the first piece is that you need to be able to understand how to measure something so to determine whether someone's done the right kind of behavior that you want, okay? So what I mean by this is, any kind of incentive can be broken into two pieces. You've got a goal, 
that's the thing that you want them to do. That's the behavior that you want them to demonstrate. That could be, you know, giving a presentation at one of your meetup events. It could be participating in a mentoring program as a mentor. And it could be creating a piece of content that you can deliver to your new members and other members. It could be running a, um, a social media campaign about your community. Those are all the different things that you want people to do. But then what happens is you need the payoff and that's the reward. So when we look at the, the, the measurement of the contribution, this is kind of really the first piece. It's this goal component. And that kind of breaks down into two areas. There is the action and the validation. And what I mean by this is imagine for the sake of argument, you said, we're going to have an incentive where um, anyone who produces a bit of content, let's say a blog post that goes up on the community, the meetup groups blog, um, we will, we got a bit of funding from a local, a local company and we'll give you a $10 Amazon gift card, right? Now you could reward people once they submit the blog post, uh, but they may submit a blog post that's not very good. Uh, that needs a lot of work. So that will be the action, is the submission of the blog post. Now, if they then submit a, a blog post that you take a look at and it's really good, it's high quality, it offers a lot of value, then that's the validation. And the validation piece, I think, is really relevant here because you want to validate good quality work. You know, years ago in communities, a good example of the wrong way to do it was every time you posted something to a forum, you would get a point and then when you reached 500 posts, you'd get like a particular badge or a particular level. And what happened is people kept responding with garbage, things like, you know, me, yeah, me too, or I agree, or plus one, like things that didn't add any content to the discussion. Um, so it incentivized the wrong thing. And the thing about incentives is whatever you incentivize, it will trigger that behavior. Because remember, this is a psychological function in human beings. So what you want to do is you want to measure effectively uh, and then get a sense of both the action as well as the value. On, there used to be a client of mine. They're a security company, and they have something called reputation right left. Um, and reputation and signal are two very important elements of how they measure participation. Essentially, what happens is um, when somebody you know website they submit a report to Hacker One. And that report is reviewed by the website, let's say it's Starbucks. If it's really good and it's got a real security issue, they'll get seven points and they'll get paid. If it's a terrible report, they'll get minus seven points and they won't get paid. And then there's, that's kind of like the two ends of the scale. So the reputation is the total number of points for those people who've submitted reports. So you can see that Mr. Hack has, you know, got a lot of reputation because he, he has submitted a ton of different reports. Um, and then the average, the, the signal is the average number of points awarded for a, a typical report, okay? So Mr. Hack is averaging out at five, just over five points in each report. That's pretty good. But look at Franz Rosen further down. Franz Rosen has submitted fewer reports, 12,000 points in reputation, but the average signal is six and a half points. This is incredible. Franz Rosen is basically killing it every single time he submits a report. So this is the reason why you want to evaluate the action as well as the validation. So let's go through a couple of examples. You know, one example could be the action could be running a meetup, but what were the results of, of, of that meetup event? You know, did it get good reviews? Did people enjoy the content? Another one could be the action could be speaking at a live or virtual event, but what did the audience think? Did they enjoy it? Did they, again, did it get good reviews? Another example could be running a workshop. Maybe you do an education workshop, a three hour tutorial type thing. You know, the action is delivering the workshop. Again, what did people think of it? How many people signed up? Was it popular? These are all good examples of things that you can kind of explore there. When you start out doing this, what I would recommend you do is put incentives for people in those different phases, right? So for the casual, the regular, and the core, and just start with the action. Just get people doing stuff. It doesn't necessarily it doesn't really matter if it's super high quality or not. Just get, get going. Start doing something that's interesting. Um, and then we'll, you know, people will gradually kind of get into the habit of this. And you'll start seeing the right, kind of, the, the right kind of work happening. But now what we need to do is look at the other side of the equation. We've got the goal, but what about the, um, the reward? Now, rewards are tricky because I'm sure a lot of you, when you think of your rewards, you think of things like T-shirts and stickers and swag, right? 
Um, but the problem with swag is that it's expensive. Um, you've got to pay to have it produced. You've got to ship it to people. And when you start shipping to different parts of the world that don't necessarily have systems in place for tracking packages very well, often it gets returned. You've got to reship it. And it costs, in many cases, you can actually spend more money on the shipping than you actually spend on the contents of the, of the envelope. So there's two types of rewards that I think you want to think of. The first type is called extrinsic, okay? And this is the swag. So, you know, for example, T-shirts, everybody seems to think T-shirts are a good idea. Don't send T-shirts. And the reason for this is you've got to have at least two different cuts. Um, you know, at a minimum, you need to have T-shirts for men and for women, but then there's other styles of cuts. Then you've got to have lots of different sizes from typically like, you know, double, double small or, you know, XXS, I don't know. I don't really know T-shirt sizing right up to, you know, 4XL. Um, and to make them work, you've got to buy them in bulk. So you'll end up having a lot of stock that you don't end up sending out. And often it's cost prohibitive for a lot of meetup groups. So T-shirts don't really work very well, but a good example would be something like a challenge coin. This is a coin that you can produce. They cost about 2 or $3 to make. It's just literally a big coin. This actually comes from the US military. You can put your own logo on there. You can bezel it. it you can make them look really nice. And the cool thing about these things is you can produce them in bulk. And maybe you think of this as like a reward for when someone does something really great in your meetup group. You send them a challenge coin and then people can connect them, you know, collect them. So you'll have someone will maybe have a picture of they've got 10 coins, right? You can almost think of it as like a trophy. And the great thing is you can pop them into an envelope. So they're easy to produce and send. So get creative in what you think about with swag. The key thing with swag, when you send people anything, is always include a handwritten note so it, be, so it feels very personal. And ideally tie, it to, to, ideally tie it to that specific person. So for example, if you want to send someone a little gift package because they've done, let, let's say they run a, a meetup group and it was really successful, uh, like a, they ran an event, sorry. Um, and let's say you find out that they are dog owners. Well, maybe you find some cool organic dog treats and you can send it to them with a nice handwritten note about thanking them for what they did. That kind of stuff will really kind of resonate with people because it's personal. It means a lot to them, okay? Now, the other side of the equation are intrinsic rewards. So this is where you recognize people, but you don't necessarily um, send them anything. Um, these are typically free, but they just take a bit of time. So for example, Somebody does some amazing work in your, in your meetup group and you've got a blog, write a blog post celebrating the work that they did, highlighting them and crediting them. You know, maybe send, just send them a, a thank you email just from the group leaders. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. It's people like you that make our community really work. Highlighting them on social media, sending them invitations to dinners or networking events. If you're a business, organizing calls with your executive team. Um, I've even seen people, I've done this with a few, a few clients where, you set up a direct line where people can go to, they can send an email to an email address and it goes to the executive team or to the group leaders. Um, providing referrals to them, writing testimonials for them on places like LinkedIn. These are all interesting ideas where you can validate and you can, and, and, and you can support somebody with a reward without necessarily having to spend any money, okay? So it's all about getting creative. And by the way, one of the things I would encourage you to do, because I know there's a lot of information in this, um, and you're probably thinking, okay, where do I even begin? One of the things I recommend you do is take this and take the recording of this when, when this is finished, sit down with your group, and then just say, okay, what should we do? Let's come up with some ideas for some, for some incentives and some rewards. And what do we do for our casual folks? What do we do for our regulars? What do we do for our core? This is a great opportunity for the group to come together to, to, to discuss these different ideas and, and different ways of doing things, okay? So how do we distribute these incentives and rewards? This is kind of the final piece that I want to get into, and then we can get onto some Q&A. So there's basically two models that, I've, uh, that I approach when I focus on, on uh, incentives. One is what I call is stated, and one is called submarine. So stated incentives are where you say, if you do this thing, you get this thing in return, right? Um, now, um, these are common, I'm going to give a bunch of examples in a second, but this is a, a fairly straight, straightforward way of doing things. You know, it could be if you join my competition and you win, you will get this prize. Okay, that's a good example of a stated incentive. It encourages people to join and participate, and then you're very clear what the criteria is to receive the reward. Now, submarine incentives are a kind of a sneaky cousin to these. And the way submarine incentives work is you detect the kind of behavior you want to see, 
and then you reward people with a as a human being okay from a person so let's get into this so first of all with it stated like i gave the example of a of a of a competition such as github's game off hacker one for example they've got the reputation and signal and they will use this to kind of send um you know uh rewards out to people but another example of this would be something like stack overflow or stack exchange where for example, if you have your question favorited by 25 users, then you get the favorite question badge. Uh, you see this in video games. If you accomplish this particular thing, then you get this particular trophy. So you could use these incentives for things such as if you run an event, if you facilitate a workshop session, if you uh, run a, uh, if you give a presentation, um, if you provide mentoring, and then you can tie some of those intrinsic and extrinsic rewards to those things. So this is a really good place to start. Okay. Now the second submarine, this requires a little bit more creativity, but this can be pretty fun. So as I mentioned, the idea of this is that you detect the right kind of behavior and then you then reward people based upon it. So to give you an example, uh, one of the tools that I often recommend a lot of my clients use is called Discourse. It's a completely open source forum platform. <clears throat> and they've got a feature in it called Trust Levels where people can go and just participate in the forum. And it's things like reading content and writing posts and liking things and having their things liked. And there's four different trust levels, okay? Zero, one, two, and three. And what happens is when you go up these trust levels, you can see it in the platform. So when someone gets into trust level two, for example, the way I do this with a lot of clients is we rebrand that as silver members. And then we know that they've done an interesting combination of posting and, and replying. They've been there for about 50% of the time since they've joined. Um, they've had a bunch of their material liked. Uh, there's no flags against them. You know, there's a very specific set of measurements that's baked into discourse. But what we'll do is a very simple thing is we'll say congratulations to George Castro, to Doctor Who, to Paulina, to Chris Winfrey, to uh, S. Cami. Um, and we recognize them. And it always gets an amazing response. So again, the system is detected in the behavior and then we reach out to them very personally what you never ever want to do never is thank people with a computer never thank people with some automated email but think about the the data that you've got available in meetup.com think about um, the, the the reviews that people have of their sessions think about the level of participation that they have in the discussions think about the ratings in the particular groups this is all good data that you can start thinking about those submarine incentives Another example of here would be uh, opensource.com. When people have written a certain amount of articles for their site, and the majority of the content is created by community members, then, then they'll send them swag and backpacks. The first time somebody uh, contributes to Mattermost, they'll send them a mug. You know, to continue the opensource.com exa uh, uh, example, um, when the, the, the top flight people, the core members of that community who contribute significantly and are very active, they'll actually fly them out to Raleigh uh, to go to an event called All Things Open, and they'll meet, you know, leaders at Red Hat, which is the company that sponsors it, like Jim Whitehurst, who's now the president of IBM. So these are all different ways in which you can explore this. The key thing, and to bring this into the end, is that we really do have this incredible network of minds out there, okay? And my goal with this session is to provide a bit of a framework in which to think about your meetup group and how you can kind of think about the different pieces, but it's all about just starting somewhere. So to get you started, First of all, I want to share this, which is my new book, People Powered. Um, I'm really thrilled with this. It just won um, the Business Book Awards recently. Uh, it's got five-star reviews on Amazon and Goodreads. I'm really thrilled with the response to it so far. It's a bestseller on Amazon and Porchlight. Um, so you might find this book interesting, but what I've actually done for this session is created um, a page, johnabacon.com slash pack. So if you go there, I'll send you, um, you know, two free chapters from the book. Um, the first two chapters in both the PDF format as well as the audiobook. So you can kind of get a start on this and get a sense of what's going on. Um, I'll also provide you with a whole load of templates that can kind of get going on this journey and then a series of video tutorial sessions. So you can kind of dig a little bit deeper into this. Um, and then I also send out just a whole load of content um, by, to you via email with just recommendations and approaches that I think might be useful in how you, in, in, in how you kind of approach your, your meetup group. So hopefully that's useful. Uh, of course, if you don't want that, that's totally fine. I just want to make an offer so you can, can kind of continue the journey. And that's me done. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop sharing. And I think we'll get into a bit of Q&A.
Thanks, John. That was fantastic. That was fantastic. Yeah, we are, we have time for Q&A, so, so stick around um, and go down at the bottom of your screen. There's the Q&A feature, so if you want to ask a question, we, we got John right here. Um, it, what was inspiring was the things that you spoke about where there's a curated experience that sometimes you don't even realize is happening. Um, I, I feel that with some of the meetup events that I've been to where I go to a writing event and you walk into the to the coffee shop when we were able to do that and someone is waving you over there's a seat you know there's a designated area for you they have the bathroom code written down and it feels like you know sometimes it feels like they haven't done anything but really you know there's there was thoughtful effort and you know they the organizer has learned over time what people need and they anticipate it and they, and they give it right to you it's it's really an experience yeah yeah i i i agree with you i mean i think so much of this is um, with anything, uh, I was literally talking to someone yesterday and they said to me, which I, I always think about this, whatever you measure, you improve. Mm -hmm. So the problem, I think the challenge, and I'm sure this is the case with many of the folks who are, um, who are watching this is I'm sure you're not experts in building communities and building meetup groups. You probably started doing this because you just wanted to get together with people and, and share your interest and share your discussion. So, um, you know, I think there's a, a real opportunity here to kind of add a bit of structure and then start doing things and just start small and measuring a little bit. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to touch on the, on the framework instead of just launching into, here's loads of incentives, because I think when you apply that, it gets, I think it gets you up and running in a much more predictable way, so. I agree. Well, let's, let's jump right into some of this Q&A. So um, yeah. David asks, uh, he's, you mentioned, Jono, about welcoming people and, and mingling at the beginning of the event and, and helping people feel, um, you know, warm and invited. So how, how, is, how is that something you can mimic when you're meeting online? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so what was the name of the person who asked that question? Uh, David. David. Thank you, David, for a great question. So um, I, I think a lot of this can be, frankly, just a good example of this would be that I've seen work over and over again is if you have like a common place where like a forum, for example, where people can go and, 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 and talk in between meet, uh, meetup events, just have an introductions topic, right? So people can go, you say, welcome to the group. Here's a place where you can go and, um, and, and introduce yourself. And I like to say, you know, share who you are, where you're from and something that people don't know about you. And that kind of gets people talking a little bit. The other thing that I would recommend is a lot of people are very new to the technology, right? They're new to, like we've seen this recently with COVID, that there are, you know, a lot of people are, um, you know, who are figuring out Zoom for the first time and all these different platforms. So for example, when someone comes and joins your group, having a two or three minute screencast video that you've made where people can go and uh, learn how to use meetup.com and how it works and how they connect with people, can be a great way of doing it as well. That's one of the reasons why at the beginning I mentioned the onboarding, that's a critical piece in trying to simplify that because a lot of community managers, for example, go out there and do a ton of outreach and engagement. But if the onboarding is too complicated, then people get stuck and they'll never tell you. So you'll never know that you're losing people. So simplifying the experience. And then as soon as people come in, this is gonna sound a little, a little ridiculous. It's all about awkward small talk. So if you see someone's new and they come into your group for the first time and they say, Hey, nice to meet everybody. You know, it's a bit like when some people show up to your, if you have a party and people show up on your doorstep for the first time, you kind of got to say, oh, how are you doing? Yeah, the weather was a bit weird today, wasn't it? You have this awkward small, small talk until people start, you know, getting to know each other a little bit. And then before you know it, everyone's kind of mingling with each other. So keep the conversation going, simplify the skills. Um, and then I think that'll help you significantly. That's awesome. That's an awesome answer. Um, uh, next, Mike asks, what tips do you have to uh, increase attendance for when, you know, you have X number of people who RSVP and X number of people who show up? How, how can you get, um, how can you incentivize them to attend, whether that is online or, or in person? Yeah. So I'm going to sound again like a bit of a broken record here. I think it's all about um, value. And the, and the value that you provide. I think we can actually weirdly learn a little bit from the marketing world about this. So I'm sure that all of you have seen these, these things where you, know, you can go and watch a video, or you, let's say a webinar, right? So I'll give you an example, actually. I'm gonna be doing a webinar uh, on the 1st of June where I'm gonna talk about how community managers can get their dream job, 
right? So I knew that if I put the webinar out there as just, I'm going to talk for an hour and go through some content, yeah. that will be interesting to some people, but they, people usually want more, right? So I'm giving away additional content, a resume template. Um, I'm going to be providing additional content that follows up after the webinar, giving some prizes away. So then you won't be able to look at the, the, the webinar page and be like, oh, so there's so much in here. Why wouldn't I sign up, right? And I'd say the same thing for your, for your meetup events, whether it's online or in person. Great content. Um, the networking piece, I think, is great. But also, maybe there's other things you can tie into that, like maybe some giveaways. Talk to local organizations if you're a local group and see if people can provide some freebies for the group. Um, I've seen meetups, for example, have local um, you know, food places kind of come and do tastings and things like that. All of this gives a reason for people to show up. The best events that I've ever seen, whether online or virtual, uh, online or in person, are filled with material. I'd rather recommend that everybody, that you run fewer meetup events and you do them at a much higher level of preparation and all of this value than trying to do them every week because that's the cadence that you agree to. You'll just get a much better attendee experience. And then what happens is you get more referrals and people are more likely to come back. So... That makes sense. All that information is something to include in, in your event description to make sure that people understand what they're getting when they are. So yeah. Cool. So that's just, well, and the final, the final thing I would touch on just very briefly, because I think it's important is also just look at how people consume that value. So for example, if you did something and people didn't really care about it, then you know that you don't necessarily need to do that again in the future. So getting feedback from your attendees, I think is super helpful there. Like, what are they like? Like, for example, I didn't realize how much people love like worksheets it sounds kind of silly to me, like it works, it's just a PDF. But maybe when someone does a presentation about, let's say 10 remote working tips, maybe then you also ask the speaker to put together a worksheet and you print out the worksheets if you're in person, you give them out to people. Little things like that I think can have a big impact. Yeah, that's true. Um, so Karen asks, could you speak a little bit about how you would monetize an event, I, like holding a class, even, even if there's a, a minimal event fee? Yeah, I, I'm generally of the view that um, there is kind of, a, I think, a cultural element of, uh, or a maybe more of an ethical pressure for a lot, of, a lot of meetup organizers that everything should be free. And my view is, if you're putting together really significant value, then I think it's okay to charge for it. I think ideally what you want to do is charge, you want to make it affordable for everybody and not everybody will be able to afford it. So I think, for example, let's say you charge $15 for someone to come to your event explaining what that money is used for. And then also, let's say there are people in, in, in more impoverished areas of your, of your area is allowing those people to, to go for free, for example, because they can't afford the $15. That's one thing I definitely look into. From a monetization perspective, I actually think one of the great ways of doing this is coordinating. So let's say your meetup event is free, but then what you do is you run things like training sessions, certification sessions, additional educational material, and then maybe you charge for that. So you have a load, this again is a lot, where a lot of marketeers work is they give away free content and then they sell something at the end of it. Um, so people get the benefit of the free content and if they're done with that, then they leave, but then they can continue and, and pay for it. And if you get a small level of conversion to that, then often that can generate the revenue that you need. Awesome. Uh, we have a question from Annette who asks, uh, they, they notice an ebb and flow in engagement in the group, sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less. Is there any, any advice on identifying when there's an ebb uh, and how to <laughs> spark some engagement? Yeah, this is where I think data analysis is super handy, right? So I'll give you an example. When I'm working with a lot of companies around building a community, I'll look at their data, let's say forum data. And if you see, for example, the number of page views is going up, but the number of signups is going down, then we know that the content in the community is getting a lot of traction by bringing people in from Google, but there's not enough reason for people to join because we all start out as window shoppers. Um, so looking at the patterns in your data, this is a great thing for your community to discuss together. A lot of organizers keep that information private to themselves and they don't share it. Or I'd open it to people and say like, what can we learn from this? And, um, and so for example, tracking as much data as you can, I think is good. Like tracking, having people review sessions and provide ratings and reviews and, and things like that. But then also, I think what you'll be able to do is when you start, for example, offering new types of value, or you maybe start doing different types of promotion, looking at the correlation between what you did and the data 
drops or the rises that you're seeing will be able to connect the action that you made to the outcome that you see. So I think the key thing I would look for is how do we understand what we did and why and how that impacted what we've got there. So to give you an example, I consistently see um, a drop off in summer with events um, because a lot of people are on vacation, right? That's just something that tends to happen. So those kinds of, I think it's looking for that, but I turn that into a group project. Uh, not everybody will be interested in it. The data nerds will be, but then that's something that I think one person can't do that. You've got to have a ton of people feeding into it because they're all going to have different ways of looking at the same thing. It's like a magic eye picture from the nineties. <laughs> no, I, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Um, everyone's going to have their own take. Well, we have about two minutes left. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and this is an important one. So this is from uh, Stoic Dan asks, um, the incentive ideas are great, um, but how, how do you deal with failures when they, when they come? Um, how, you know, knowing that, you know, every incentive is not gonna work for every member, um, how, how do organizers press forward and move on from, from those failures? Right. So the first thing I would say is, failure i mean this sounds like a horrible business cliche failure is part of the journey to building cool things i think so the first time you do anything it's probably going to suck so the first time you try your incentives it probably won't resonate as much and i would look at how you optimize it and then watch the results so you know for example um you know if you've got um, a meetup page and you want people to come and join your upcoming group then um, and you don't get a lot of signups. Well, maybe the copy written on the page wasn't good enough. It wasn't exciting enough. Maybe it doesn't have a good enough headline. Don't make it Buzzfeed clickbait, but that's a good thing to refine. So maybe you make some changes and then you get more signups. And therefore that means that probably that change was a good thing. So I would look at this as an iterative model. Um, I think the key thing is look, there's an obstacle in every failure. Like what was the thing that didn't work? You know, and I'd say, just keep trying things the best communities that I've ever seen, they just keep trying ideas. And then what they do is they see the ones that work and they stick with those and they put those into the rotation. But then the other things that didn't quite work, then they'll just say, oh, well, that didn't really work. And we'll try something else. So I wouldn't look at it so as so much just blunt failure. It's more, it's another piece of data that you can learn from. Uh, and then if you try something, you've tried every possible way of making it work. Like let's say you keep adding the content to the meetup page and just no one's signing up for it then maybe the topic's just not interesting enough and you find a different topic, so. Yeah, just keep, just keep pushing forward. Keep um, on, keep on. <laughs> thank you so much, Jono. I, I just wanna say to everyone watching, thank you for coming. And um, we're going to post a recording of this video. If you signed in late, we said this in the beginning, but this is being recorded um, and it's gonna be on meetup.com slash blog. Uh, and if you sign up for our newsletter, you'll receive an email when this is live. So I encourage you to do that and to, to keep up with our blog. But thank you so much, Jono. Thank you for everyone. Thank who you. Take care.